Hello everyone, welcome to Sustainer Step, your free guide to everything sustainability. I'm Karam. In our journey to understand and combat climate change, it's vital that we understand the different types of greenhouse gas emissions. One of the most critical types of these emissions is scope one emissions. These are the emissions that a company or an individual directly releases into the environment. They are a key component in assessing the carbon footprint of an entity, whether it's a multinational corporation or a single household. Understanding how to calculate these emissions is not just an academic exercise. It is a practical tool that can help us all make more informed decisions about our actions and their impact on our planet. So, buckle up for an enlightening journey into the world of emissions, where numbers meet the environment. So today we are going to learn how to calculate scope one emissions, step by step. Before we jump into calculations, it's crucial to understand what scope one emissions are. Now, you may be wondering, what in the world are scope one emissions? Well, let's break it down. Scope one emissions are direct emissions from owned or controlled sources. They're the greenhouse gases that are released straight into the atmosphere from our activities. Think about the carbon dioxide that comes out of your car's exhaust pipe, or the methane that's released when organic waste decomposes in your garden compost. Those are direct emissions, and they fall into the category of scope one emissions. This category is the most direct and usually the largest source of emissions for many organizations. For instance, if you run a manufacturing company, your scope one emissions could come from the combustion of fuel in your boilers, generators and vehicles. They could also come from the chemical reactions that occur during your production process. In a nutshell, if it's under your control and it's releasing greenhouse gases, it's likely a scope one emission source. Now let's consider some examples to make this concept more tangible. Imagine you own a fleet of delivery trucks. Every time those trucks hit the road, they're burning fuel and emitting carbon dioxide. Those emissions? Yep, you guessed it. Scope one, or say you're in charge of a factory. The energy used to heat that factory, the emissions from the machinery used in production, and even the gases released when creating the products themselves. All these are scope one emissions. Why do we need to understand scope one emissions? Well, it's simple. By identifying and understanding these emissions, we can start to take steps to reduce them. And as we all know, reducing greenhouse gas emissions is vital for combating climate change. Now that we have a clear understanding of scope one emissions, we can proceed to the calculation part. So stick around, because in the next scene, we're going to get into the nitty gritty of how to calculate your scope one emissions. Calculating scope one emissions requires some data gathering. Now let's delve into the details of what that entails. Firstly, we need to know the amount of fuel used in your operations. This could be anything from gasoline for your fleet vehicles to natural gas for heating your facilities. This information is typically available from your fuel supplier or from your own internal tracking systems. Secondly, electricity consumption is key. Even though electricity use is generally classified as a scope two emission, it can be categorized as scope one if the electricity is produced on site. For instance, if you have a generator at your facility, the emissions from that generator would fall under scope one. You can usually find this data on your utility bills or again from your internal tracking systems. Then, there are process emissions. These are emissions that result from your actual operational processes. For example, if you're a cement manufacturer, the chemical reactions involved in making cement produce carbon dioxide, a greenhouse gas. To calculate these emissions, you'll need detailed knowledge of your production processes and the specific quantities of materials used. Finally, don't overlook fugitive emissions. These are emissions that are not physically controlled but are released to the atmosphere, such as refrigerant leaks from air conditioning systems. To account for these, you'll need to keep track of the quantities of refrigerants or other gases used and any losses that occur. Gathering this data might seem like a daunting task, but it's an essential step towards understanding and reducing your greenhouse gas emissions. And remember, this is not a one-time exercise. It's something that needs to be done regularly to monitor your progress and make necessary adjustments. Start by taking small steps. Begin with the data that is readily available and gradually expand your data collection efforts. Before you know it, you'll have a comprehensive data set that gives you a clear picture of your scope one emissions. With all the necessary data at hand, we are ready to start calculating. Now comes the exciting part, the calculation of scope one emissions.
let's dive right into it. The calculation process is a meticulous one, requiring a careful understanding of each step. But don't worry, we'll walk through it together, one step at a time. First and foremost, we need to identify the sources of Scope 1 emissions. These are direct emissions that come from sources owned or controlled by your organization. They could be from the combustion of fossil fuels like coal or natural gas, or from the use of company-owned vehicles, or even from the chemical reactions in manufacturing processes. Once we've identified the sources, the next step is to gather the data. This might seem like a daunting task, but it's absolutely essential. We need to know how much of each type of fuel is being used, or how many miles are being driven by company vehicles. This data will form the basis of our calculations, so it's important that it's as accurate as possible. Now this is where it gets a bit technical. We have to convert this data into carbon dioxide equivalent emissions, or CO2e. This is a standard unit for measuring carbon footprints, and it allows us to compare the emissions from different sources on a like-for-like -like basis. To do this, we use what are known as emission factors. These are coefficients that convert activity data, like fuel use or miles driven, into greenhouse gas emissions. They are specific to each type of fuel or activity, and they take into account the global warming potential of the different gases emitted. So, for example, if we're calculating emissions from natural gas combustion, we would multiply the amount of natural gas used by the emission factor for natural gas. This gives us the total CO2e emissions from that source, but remember we're not just calculating emissions from one source, we're adding up emissions from all the different sources identified in the first step. So we need to repeat this process for each one, and then add them all together to get the total scope one emissions. That might sound like a lot of work, but it's actually quite straightforward once you get the hang of it, and it's absolutely worth it. By accurately calculating Scope 1 emissions, you can identify where the biggest emissions are coming from and focus your efforts on reducing those. The importance of each step in this process cannot be overstated. Identifying the sources of emissions ensures that none are overlooked. Gathering accurate data ensures that the calculations are based on real-world information, and using emission factors ensures that the calculations are consistent and comparable. In fact, the entire process is designed to ensure precision because when it comes to calculating scope one emissions, precision is key. It's the difference between knowing exactly where you stand and making an educated guess. And when it comes to tackling climate change, we can't afford to guess. So there you have it. That's how you calculate scope one emissions. It's a process of identification, data gathering and calculation, all aimed at achieving the highest possible level of accuracy. And while it might seem daunting at first, don't worry, with a bit of practice, you'll become a pro in no time. Remember, precision is key in these calculations. After calculating scope one emissions, it's essential to understand what the results mean. The numbers you see are not just numbers. They tell a story about your direct emissions and the role they play in the overall carbon footprint. Imagine the figures as a mirror, reflecting your actions and their impact on the environment. A higher scope one emission result means your activities are directly releasing more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. This could be from burning fossil fuels for heating, electricity or transportation, or from industrial processes. It's like a wake-up call, signalling that it's time to reassess and adjust your actions. On the other hand, a lower scope one emission result indicates that your direct emissions are relatively less. This might be because you are using renewable energy sources, have energy efficient processes, or perhaps you've implemented emission reduction strategies. It's a pat on the back, but remember there's always room for improvement. Now, how does this all tie into your overall carbon footprint? Well, scope one emissions are just one piece of the puzzle. They form part of your total emissions, along with scope two and scope three emissions. Collectively, these give a comprehensive view of your environmental impact. So if your scope one emissions are high, your total carbon footprint is likely on the higher side too. This could affect your sustainability credentials and even your reputation. But don't let high numbers discourage you. They serve as a guide, pointing out where you can make changes to reduce your emissions. On the flip side, if your scope one emissions are low, it's a step in the right direction. But don't get complacent. Remember to consider the other scopes to get a holistic view of your carbon footprint. In essence, interpreting these results is not about feeling good or bad about the figures. It's about understanding their significance, using them as a tool for change, 
and continually striving for a smaller carbon footprint. Interpreting the results correctly helps in making informed decisions for sustainability. So, that's all about calculating scope 1 emissions. I hope you found this guide helpful. We've taken quite the journey today, haven't we? We started by understanding what scope 1 emissions are. Those direct emissions from sources owned or controlled by an entity, like fossil fuels for heating and vehicles, or emissions from chemical reactions in industrial processes. We've learned that they are the first an often most significant step in painting a picture of an organization's carbon footprint. Then, we moved on to preparing for the calculation. We talked about identifying the sources of emissions and collecting the necessary data, such as the type of fuel used, the amount consumed, and the emission factor associated with each fuel type. Remember, good preparation is key to getting an accurate result. We then dove into the calculation process itself, using the formula Activity data X emission factor equals emissions. We discussed how to apply this formula to each source of emissions identified and how to sum up all these results to get the total scope 1 emissions. Finally, we interpreted the results. We emphasized that the total number is not just a number, but a reflection of your impact on the environment. It's a starting point for setting emission reduction targets and implementing strategies to achieve them. Remember, Understanding and calculating Scope 1 emissions is not just about compliance with regulations or ticking a box for sustainability reports. It's about taking responsibility for our actions, about recognizing the impact we have on the environment and taking steps to reduce it. It's the first step in our journey towards sustainability. And with that, we've reached the end of our guide. Don't forget to subscribe to Sustain a Step for more free sustainability tips and guides. And if you found this video useful, please hit the thumbs up button. It really helps the channel grow. Thank you for watching and let's continue our journey towards sustainability together.